A Johnson & Johnson's vaccine candidate showed strong protection against COVID-19, but is fueling concern about some of those mutant strains of the virus. Let's bring in former FDA Commissioner Dr. Scott Gottlieb, currently serves on the boards of Illumina and Pfizer. He's also a CNBC contributor. In his latest op-ed, he tackles the different vaccines as well as the different strains of COVID. Uh, Dr. Gottlieb, it's good to, to see you this morning. And, and we, we, we talked about this when the news came out, that it's a one-shot uh, dose and that the, the Pfizer and Moderna uh, versions after one shot, I don't think we're even 70. So uh, the people that were looking at apples to apples needed to, to take that into account. The efficacy was impressive in, in your view, even though we hear 95 and, you know, I'd rather have 95 than 70. I'll take the two shot. Well, I'll take what I can get, actually, as a consumer. But look, this is a good result. Um, you're right that when you look at the mRNA vaccines, we saw some data on the impact of the first dose, but we didn't follow it out to 49 days like we have with the J&J &J vaccine. So you can't make apples to apples comparisons across these clinical trials. The, the bottom line is this is a vaccine that can be delivered in an austere setting, doesn't need to be um, stored in special handling. It's one shot, uh, and it produced a good result. This is a very good result. I mean, J&J &J swung, uh, swung for the fences here, and they hit a triple because they tried to get a one-dose vaccine. Um, on an absolute basis, the efficacy might be diminished relative to the mRNA vaccines, but this is a one-dose vaccine, and the bottom line is they have a trial underway looking at two-dose data, and they may well uh, end up showing improved efficacy with a second dose, and a lot of people who get vaccinated with this single dose probably in March and April may come back in two or three months and get a second dose of the vaccine. So this is a very good result. I think this is going to be an important entry into the market for a lot of patients. Okay. The concern about the mutant strain, I guess it was the South African, it was based on what data and what does it say? Right. So they had a uh, data set in South Africa where about 90 percent of the patients that were enrolled in their arm in South Africa who got vaccinated, um, there was more breakthrough. The, the efficacy was about 57 percent in the South Africa arm of the trial. So what it shows is that the vaccine has diminished efficacy uh, against that variant. That shouldn't surprise us. We have experimental evidence that suggests the same. We now have results with the Novavax vaccine indicating the same I would expect that the mRNA vaccines are going to show some decline in efficacy against um, the South African variant and the Brazilian variant. Maybe not as much, but probably some hit. I think all the vaccines are going to take some hit, but that's still a good result. I mean, if the mRNA vaccines are 70, 80 percent protective against that variant and the J&J &J vaccine is about 60, 60 percent protective against that variant just after one dose, you still ha you're still affording a high measure of protection against that variant. And what we what we now seems to be the case is that the Brazilian variant and the South African variant may not be more fit. We know B117, which is a UK variant, is more fit, meaning it's more contagious, so it's spreading more readily. But we haven't seen the, the variant in Brazil, P1, and the variant in South Africa, B1351, break out yet. And one of the reasons why that might be the case, one of the theories, is that it's, it may be um, more virulent insofar as people who've been infected previously are getting reinfected, but it may not be more fit. It may not be more contagious. Um, so we have time probably to develop boosters specifically targeted to these variants, hopefully. This experience and, and the, the evidence that we're, we're seeing here, what does that say about year after year in terms of, of COVID mutations and whether it's similar to what we go through every year with, uh, with the, the flu vaccines? And the flu vaccines, even though everyone doesn't get them, we never seem to really have an epidemic. Is there? Do we? Would we still have some type of herd immunity with COVID, even if it were to come back with a varying strain every year? Would it ever be as bad as the first uh, as the first pandemic? Yeah, well, we actually do have the equivalent of a pandemic to flu each year in terms of how it spreads. We just it's predictable, so we don't call it a pandemic, but it does spread around the world um, in a pandemic-like fashion, even a seasonal. Flu. Some of the conventional wisdom right now is that the um, ways that this virus can mutate itself to try to change its proteins and evade prior immunity, prior infection, or evade our vaccines is finite. There's not going to be an infinite number of ways that this vaccine is going to, going to try to defeat immunity. And therefore, we, we should be able to um, engineer a complement of different kinds of boosters that will protect to some degree against the range of ways that this, vaccine could, this virus can change itself. That is some of the thinking right now. 
I think that we're going to be able to keep up with this. This doesn't mutate as rapidly as flu. I don't think it's going to mutate in the span of a single season where it's going to entirely defeat our vaccines. Maybe it will partially defeat them, but it's not going to be able to entirely evade the vaccines as quickly as flu does. This virus probably is, sits somewhere in between measles, which doesn't change its surface proteins, therefore our vaccine is stable, and flu, which changes its surface proteins very readily, and therefore our vaccine could be defeated within a span of one season. This coronavirus probably is in the middle somewhere. It's going to change its surface proteins, but it's probably going to do it gradually enough that we'll be able to engineer new boosters and make them available. And one of the things I talk about in the Wall Street Journal today is the idea of developing a range of different um, you know, variations of the vaccines and having them on the shelf and scaling up productions of the ones that we think are going to become the predominant strain. And remember, we can also develop bivalent vaccines here. We can also put two different um, forms of the virus into a syringe and develop a vaccine that can cover more than one strain. Well, of course. Of course we could develop bivalent. Of it. No, we are really well, getting in the weeds, weeds right. here uh, we, with, with, the, <laughs> with the advanced virology. Let me ask you about, so the, the, I assume the cold virus is able to mutate its, uh, its surface proteins so much that, that we can't really, because there are questions that, that people have. It's like, wait, I got, it, I got you know, vaccinated when I was a child and still don't get this. Why am I getting, you know, vaccinated every year? And it's it, so it, this is all based on uh, the, the ease of mutation with the surface proteins. That's right. It, it, it's based on the ability of a virus to um, accept into its genome, into its RNA, changes that will code for different uh, proteins on its surface okay. that become the target of our immune system. And some viruses like measles can't do that. Some do it very readily, like flu. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.